The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to today's webinar on landlord-tenant law. Our presenter today is John Liberatos, CEO of leasingandmanagement.com, parent company of four South Carolina offices, including rentcharleston.com, rentjamesisland.com, rentmountpleasant.com, and rentwnc.com. He comes with 22 years in real estate and property management and 17 years as a broker in charge. He is vice president of the Charleston chapter of National Association of Residential Property Managers. He has served on numerous realtor committees and currently serves as an MLS board of director member. Thanks for joining us today, John, and now I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. Can everyone hear me okay? I appreciate that. Can everyone hear me okay? I appreciate that. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, you sound good, John. Okay, thanks. Um, well, I hope everyone can hear me well. If you can't uh, speak up or try to text me, um, as you can see in the GoToWebinar, um, you've got a place that you can type in the chat, and I can see that, so feel free to, to chat there. Um, if you are live in audio, feel free to interrupt me at any time. If you have a question, I'm happy to uh, stop what I'm, I'm saying to address an issue or a question you may have as we go along. So without further ado, um, this is a class I gave to attorneys um, last year for their legal continuing ed. So it's going to be a lot about landlord-tenant law, um, some fair housing, and hopefully you'll gain some insight on some of the issues you may see in leases and in applications, and I'm going to give you some advice on that. So without further ado, um, you've already heard about me. We manage, we're almost about a thousand units and 34 associations. I've got a lot of experience as, as Mike said, so I'm not going to linger on that. Um, I am not an attorney, um, so don't take what I say as the ultimate law. Um, I'm just giving you property management experience. If you have a legal question or legal issue, um, don't go saying, hey, John Liberatus told me, hey, this is the way it was. I'm going to go ahead and tell you I'm not an attorney. We're going to talk a little bit about lease drafting, structuring, and negotiating in just a minute. Um, tenant screening, we're going to start with that because there's a process for tenants, right? You do, you know, maybe come to, you show the unit or, or a house, tenant comes in and they say, oh, yeah, I want it. So there's a process that goes along with that. And usually it begins with an application and tenant screening. <clears throat> fair housing is something that's going to come up several times, and there's been some changes to fair housing that happened last year that I, I know that many property managers I have spoken with do not know yet. So we're going to talk about that in just a minute. You know, the Fair Housing Act is, is part of the 1968 Civil Rights Act and has amendments in 1988. And the bulk of it, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because protected classes are something that most property managers know. So I'm not going to go over each protected class. I'll probably go over a couple of new ones. But now when you're, when you're going ready to, to lease a property to somebody, these are the protected classes uh, that you cannot deny on. One is race, color, national origin, religion, sex, family status, and with the 1988, there's an amendment with disability. Now, the American with Disabilities Act, I want to touch on for a second because that's become quite important. Alcoholism is something that the, the ADA now looks at as, well, that's an illness. Um, if you are denying somebody uh, based on the fact that maybe you spoke to a previous landlord and the landlord said, oh, look, this guy's an alcoholic, he's a drunk, and you deny him on that, you could be faced with some very serious issues. Are there any questions about that? Um, okay. This is a new one as of uh, April of last year, and it's hoarding. I don't know if anybody has had a hoarder or tried to evict a hoarder or had damages from a hoarder, but hoarder is an, is an issue that is now protected. They consider it uh, a mental illness, uh, if, if you will. And there are a lot of underlying challenges with property managers these days with hoarding. For instance, 
in the application process, let's say you call a, a prior landlord. The prior landlord says, look, man, they, they damaged the property and because they're hoarding and here are the pictures. Um, you know, if you deny them based on that, realize that they could make a disabilities claim saying, look, this is discrimination. Um, it's an illness. Uh, likewise, if you go to evict, um, hoarding probably is not the method for which you're filing an eviction or an ejectment. You may, if it's maybe they're paying rent late, I know there is some legal arguments on violating some city ordinances or some county ordinances with hoarding. Uh, maybe they're doing a lot of damage to the property by their hoarding. Be careful when you go to an ejectment for hoarding as they are protected. Um, any, uh, any questions out there so far? All right. Um, so here we have where you go to, um, you know, a, a little bit of a life lesson here. Your application asks applicants if they had a criminal history and you don't rent to someone who has a conviction. Well, let's say somebody has three prior drug convictions and wants you to forgive these because he's been rehabilitated from his drug habit. Let's say you refuse him based on this criminal past. Um, how many of you would deny somebody based on that? Feel free to speak up. Um, in this day and age, um, drug addiction is covered under Fair Housing Act. If they are recovering alcoholic or drug addict, they're covered. You can't deny them based on that. Any questions about that? So, and here's you have, have the, you know, if you refuse to rent to these folks, um, because based on criminal conviction, you know, one of the things you have to do is consistency. You may hear me talk about consistency on a regular basis. And that means if you're going to refuse to one, then you have to refuse to all, as long as you're not violating um, fair housing. Students, I know that's a big market in Charleston, uh, it's a big market in Columbia. Um, uh, we manage a lot of student rentals in South Carolina. We manage a few student housing up in North Carolina. Um, which, by the way, the law is quite different. But uh, students are something that you absolutely can deny on, but let me tell you some of the pitfalls to that. Um, students are not a protected class, um, but if you're going to do that, you need to be very specific in the language that you put in your application. You need to be very specific on the language you put in your advertising. If you advertise something and it says, no students, I would recommend being very clear about that. No students means every student. In other words, undergraduate, graduate, medical, law. And the issue has come up, and I have seen issues where a property manager said no students and then rented to a medical student. You know, at that point where what's going to happen is the student that got denied because they were perhaps an undergraduate student was, wait a minute, you, you rented to a medical student. It's not uncommon in property management for student housing for property managers to go, look, we know that undergraduates, not every time, but oftentimes can beat property up. Whereas med students, not every time, but most of the time typically make very good um, tenants be careful on how you word no students. Any questions with that? Um, I see that someone's asking, is there a website to keep up with what's covered under fair housing? Um, yes, there's a, a national website you can go to. Um, I can get that to you in just a minute. So let's say you've done one of these issues and, you know, let's say you put you know, I, I'm not going to rent an undergraduate, but you rent it to a graduate student or a med student. How long does a complainant have to complain about it? Well, they have six months to a year to file for a harmful housing action, depending on the agency. So with HUD, um, complaints must file within one year. With the SEHAC, 
it requires 180 days. So they have to do it pretty quickly in South Carolina, but nationally the HUD gives you a whole year. Any questions about that? Violations. This is a big issue um, with fair housing and quite a number of issues that come up with your lease, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. Um, and normally what I've seen happen over the years is that not only does a property manager get uh, hit with a violation, <coughs> they'll hit the property owner, they'll hit screening services, um, and I'll give you an example of that. <coughs> there was a large lawsuit not too many years ago in South Carolina, and a uh, property manager had an on-site, this was for an apartment complex, and they had an on-site maintenance guy, and they had run a credit check on this on-house maintenance guy, and it came up clean. Um, they'd run a criminal background check on this maintenance guy, and two came up clean. One day the repair guy, and he's known around the complex because he's the only one on site who does all the repairs. They, most people know him by name. Well, he knocks on the door for a unit that had an issue that he was supposed to go fix or correct. Um, goes into the unit and physically assaults uh, the girl who was living in the unit. Lawsuit comes about from that. Property management company goes, well, we did a proper screening. We hired a third-party screening service. They ran a criminal background check and came up clean. Issue with screening services, third-party screening services, and any screening service for that issue is that not every state releases criminal background checks or criminal records. Um, if you've got you know, a maintenance guy, maybe he's coming from California. Well, they don't release the criminal um, results from California and Colorado and several other states. That property manager actually, from what I'm told, uh, ended up losing that lawsuit. Um, so be careful when you're doing your screening services and who you hired. Know that you know maybe just the screening service you're using doesn't cover the criminal background check for everywhere. Um, right now, to my knowledge, unless somebody knows of one, I have not heard of one that is perfect. That gets criminal background checks across the country, especially in states where they don't release it nationally. Any questions about that? That's a big, big issue. It's a big issue with not only who a property manager hires, it also affects um, your tenants that you are doing criminal background checks. Um, I'm not in the room with you. Normally I would show maybe a raise of hands how many of you use criminal background checks and see which ones you're using um, to find out whether you're doing it the right way, which is at least getting some criminal background check that will at least limit some of your liability, but not all of it. Uh, the property manager that gets in the really big trouble is when an issue happens and they didn't do any criminal background check. You know, there's sort of this pecking order of lawsuits and when attorneys go after a property manager and they go, yes, we did a, you know, a background check, <coughs> excuse me, and it came out negative, at least if you're in front of a judge or a jury, you know, if you've done something, it's better than nothing. Um, am I making sense about that? Any questions? That's going to play a big role in as more and more lawsuits seem to be coming out of um, tenant screening and criminal background checks that don't show up. So how do you avoid these issues? Well, there are two main ways to avoid these issues. One is consistency, and that is probably one of the biggest issues not only I've seen with property management companies and lawsuits is the inconsistency. So if you've maybe done a criminal background check on half your tenants but not all your tenants, maybe you know some tenants you just knew, maybe you personally knew them, or maybe they were you know, kids of your friend that are looking for an apartment or they were med students, somehow you knew them and you didn't run the criminal background check on them, that's where the issue comes up. It's the consistency. A lawyer gets hold of that and then 
gets a lawsuit and they ask you, well, Mr. Property Manager or Miss Property Manager, um, do you run criminal background checks on everybody? The minute you say, no, I actually don't run them on everybody, you've lost. Your ship has sunk. The second way to avoid issues is to have a clearly defined written policy. And that written policy should be um, in your office. All your property managers know it. All of your employees know it. Um, anyone that works for you knows your written policy. And when it comes to issues of tenant screening, um, those are things that should be consistent on your application. Maybe if you have a website, um, <clears throat> make sure it's written that it's in clear English. Look, you know, if, if let's say your business model is you do not rent to anyone who has a credit score of, say, less than, you know, pick a number, say 600. If you rent to someone with under 600, you kind of violated your own written policy. If you deny somebody based on credit, and of course that's a separate issue because you need to have sort of a prepared letter. This is why, here's your credit report, and here's access to that. Um, written policy is, is crucial if a lawsuit were to come about. Are there any questions about this? Um, we're going to talk just a few minutes about application screening. Here is where your clear written screening policy is, is key. If you're going to have certain requirements, make sure it's on your application website, anything you give to a tenant. And then your consistency is to follow that policy. So you have a tenant and they're going through an application. Now this is just the state application, rental application, um, which is fine. Uh, make sure it's all completed. Make sure you get all the information correct. Um, make sure there's a signature. I have heard of a couple of cases <coughs> where the tenant didn't sign the application. And if you deny somebody based on something they haven't even signed a credit application, you're not doing your job properly. They could come back to bite you. In your application, this is some language that I know there are quite a few property management companies that use their own application or maybe they've gotten one off the web or maybe a national site. This is real important language to have in your application. I have actually seen applications that do not have this language in them. And part of it is that the application the applicant is authorizing the landlord to verify the information, uh, it allows you to, to call their employer and verify employment, it allows you to call their previous property managers to verify their rental history. Um, this is where your signature is real key. Um, if you're working on an application and they haven't signed it and you've called their employer and you've called uh, their past landlord um, and you don't have the signature of the applicant, that's a real issue. The other language that's very important in here is that there's a, if you scroll, go down to the third paragraph, um, second sentence, um, the application, the applicant agrees that no course of action may be brought against a property manager or real estate broker representing tenant or landlord and all affiliate agents for failure to obtain or disclose any information contained in the South Carolina Sex Offender Registry. Um, that's something that I would strongly urge that you have language in your application. I have seen applications without it and it could be an issue for you. Any questions about that? I got to tell you, it's, I teach a lot of classes and it's a little offbeat to not have people in the room raising their hands. So feel free to speak up. Um, this is our language. Uh, if anybody wants it, we, we have our own language. This actually spells out certain things. Um, this one has like certain applications. Um, and credit score, this is where it's consistency. Um, you know, have a credit number, you know, you can deny the right of a minimum standard. Um, I recommend that in your applications. Um, there's a question on can we get a copy of this information? Absolutely. I don't know if this, I know the state is recording this. I don't know if they can, we'll get a copy of the webinar or the keynote. If you email me, I'm happy to send you um, whatever it is you would like to have. Um, and my email is john at rentcharleston.com. 
Um, vendors. This has been a serious issue across the country and kind of goes with what we talked about a minute ago, which is, especially with the criminal background, there's no real, I can't go to one source and go, okay, here is, you know, the criminal background check for this person and it's guaranteed and it's um, all 50 states. Um, you can't get that information. So the, uh, until something of that happens, um, you've got some risk. There's definitely some risk in property management. Probably why you see your errors and emissions insurance um, get higher and higher. Um, credit agencies are another vendor that I think just about every property manager uses. Um, one is not maybe better than the other. There are quite a few. Um, utilizing the big three usually it has some advantages. The advantages are it, it, it reaches further and farther than some of the smaller vendors. And then tenant verification vendors are also, there are a slew of tenant verification vendors. I mean, you know, here are just a few of those that you can check. Whatever one fits your business model works great, but just know that there are, of course, risks involved as they're not checking everything. I recommend that, you know, application accuracy in your lease is very important. Um, this allows a landlord to have a clause in there that says basically the tenant has has been honest and truthful in their application and if um, for some reason whatsoever you find out that they've lied on there that at least you can you know reclaim some of the damages based on that. <clears throat> There's a number of different things that could happen from that. It gives you a little bit, not a lot, but it gives you a little bit of cushion if you've done a criminal background check on a, an applicant and it came back negative and let's say they lied about it. So maybe they, their initial was off or they used a, a false social security number that maybe somebody with the same name, maybe their father or um, something of that nature. At least this gives you some cushions within that. There's a question that if a credit score is lower than a minimum, can the applicants do anything to gain approval keeping us legal? I would say uh, yes and no. Yes in that if you read the language, at least in ours, <coughs> it uses the word may. Um, agrees the property manager may. <coughs> Sorry. And that's why in our leases, and I'll tell you a little bit about our lease. I recently served on the state forms committee and we spent myself and several really great property managers and an attorney spent a lot of time kind of revising the state lease and a lot of the language came from a lease that we use which is a proprietary lease and that's what you'll see. You're going to see some of that coming up. The state hasn't approved it yet. They're still working on that, but you see that coming up. But in our leases, we bold, anything that's important, bold, underline, all caps, make it very clear to the applicant, uh, the tenant that's getting ready to lease your property, that this is important. To answer your question about gaining approval and keep it legal, of course you can. That's why we use the word may. By signing this applicant, understands that his application may be denied if the applicant's credit score, say, is in our case, is less than 620. Um, you know, maybe in this day and age, as you, as a lot of property managers have seen, there's been a lot of foreclosures. There's been a lot of bankruptcies, and sometimes credit scores are lower. That's why you have a process. As long as you are consistent, um, that you know, in your application, you show it's not just the credit score. It's not black and white, just credit. Uh, we'll contact previous landlords, employers, things of that nature. Maybe they had lost their job and their credit score is, is, is a low credit score um, for your company model. Uh, but maybe they've got a new job and they've got some you know, income coming in. Um, does that answer your question? <clears throat> so um, utilizing past landlords, employment, credit, that's a good segue into this. Um, because I think that any landlord that uses just a credit score um, is probably remiss in, in getting good quality tenants in this day and age. 
Uh, the last few years, we've seen tremendous landlords, um, you know, have the issue of, well, we've got bad credit scores. Well, after 2008 housing crash, lots of people that have good jobs but have bad credit. So make sure that the consistency is, is in your application and what you do for one, do for all. So if you've got a consistent, hey, we, we're consistently seeing credit scores low, but maybe they've got past landlords that say, yes, great tenant, make that part of your written policy with your property managers. Uh, make sure that your written policy says, okay, this is the process if the credit score is below what our company allows. <coughs> Excuse me. And maybe that's just a letter from their employer that says, yes, they've got a job. Um, we verify their income. Make it consistent. Make it in writing. And more importantly, really, what I see is make sure all of your employees or your property managers know what the written policy is. What I see more often than not is in any given property management office, whether you're a, a three person operation, or a 30-person operation is that somebody, some property manager doesn't really know the process and they are the ones that go, oh yeah, credit score a little lower, no worries. And they maybe go about the wrong way and that's the person that gets denied and then their lawyer goes, well, wait a minute now, you did this for everybody else but not this person, that's discrimination. Any questions about that? So we move on, your tenants, you've gone through that process, your tenant's been approved, and you're going on to the lease. <clears throat> this is um, the state lease, and we debated about this on the forms committee for a long time. There's a couple of different ways to do. Um, I'm going to show you several clauses in the state lease um, from a legal standpoint that, and I'm going to show you the way we recommend it to the state. Some changes you'll see in the state form if and when that gets approved and you'll see it the way we do it. In the state lease, what you see um, is two, two people involved in the, in the lease, the tenant and the landlord. Well, there's actually a little bit of question about the landlord in some respects, isn't there? Um, the landlord, the general assumption is, well, the landlord is the property manager. Well, from a legal standpoint, really the landlord in some cases would be the owner. And in some municipalities um, where they have things like livability courts, um, they expect the owner of the property to really be the landlord and the property manager is merely the agent of the landlord. There's also some debate, and there's no right or wrong to that by the way, I'm just telling you the two different ways that there are to do it. Um, another method is, well, I'm a property manager and do who is the landlord? Do I put the owner's name in there, or do we put my name in there, the property manager or the property management firm? Um, there's a lot of debate about that, and if there's any lawyers listening to the webinar, I'm sure they have some opinions. I've heard good and bad on a number of cases both ways. The way we do it is the tenant would be in there, and the owner is the landlord, <coughs> and we are his agent. So in our, our lease, and I'm happy to get you a copy of that if you like. Um, tenant, tenant, owner is the landlord, and we are the agent. Um, and of course, the agent, we've added agent under the next thing. You have to disclose that you're licensed, of course. Further into our lease, to verify that we're agent and landlord, um, we have a clause in there, and it says agent is, agent is authorized agent of landlord for the purposes of managing property in accordance with a separate management agreement and how we keep tenants from contacting their landlord or their owner is agrees to communicate with the agent on all issues relating or arising out of the rental agreement. Any questions about that so far? It's kind of an important point. In some respects, if you're going to get sued and you are the landlord and you're named in the lease as the landlord and the owner is not named in there at all, it may, to some lawyers' minds or to some judges' eyes and to some jury's eyes, may increase your liability. <clears throat> if you've got a homeowner where maybe you've had a, a fall on the property, maybe their homeowner's policy says, no, you're the landlord, it's just you. 
So beware of that. <clears throat> to talk a little bit about the South Carolina Residential Landlord Tenant Act, make sure that that is in any lease you have in there because that's the governing rules for um, uh, your lease. Um, look for other, hopefully the state will ask me to do another webinar. I teach a lot of classes here in Charleston on the South Carolina Landlord Tenant Act. If you go to one of my classes or other classes, if you're practicing property management, I think it is absolutely crucial that you go to some South Carolina Residential Landlord Tenant Act classes. Um, you know, it's, it's not as easy as you think and having someone teach you some of the subtleties is important. Um, premises, this is uh, pretty cut and paste. In a lease, you want to make sure that the terms are very specific. Um, and in our case, where we have a lot of student housing and there always seems to be some issues about someone moving out, someone moving in. If you'll notice in our particular lease, and I believe we recommended it for the state lease, we actually put a time deadline for the term. The state lease as it stands now is just one day to another day and it doesn't specific to a time. So in our lease, for instance, in this case, starts the first day of January 2013 at noon and it ends on the 31st of December at noon. What that does is it clearly defines for a tenant that you have to be out by noon and then you've got a window of opportunity for the next tenant for maybe you have some repairs, it doesn't give you a lot, but maybe you have cleaning, gives you time for your inspections, <clears throat> whole nine yards. But as it stands now in the state lease, although I must confess I haven't looked at the state lease in a while, but I believe it doesn't have a time period. So that in theory, tenant could stay there till midnight and then the other tenant may be saying they want to move in at 12.01. It creates some issues, so we've kind of clarified that a little bit. Um, in South Carolina, you're allowed to put a total rent. Um, this is something you don't see in North Carolina, or if you see it, judges don't really follow it. Um, but here you would have um, a total rent and you're breaking it down into monthly installments it's crucial that you put a total rent in South Carolina because if you're going after damages that's kind of the basis of your suit if they moved out early or they abandoned the lease and you know you want to go after the balance or at least by law at least until you've got it rented again. In North Carolina it's the tenant leaves that's it's too bad. Make sure you put a physical mailing address that's important these days there are, I have seen quite a few property management companies who are virtual, at least get some sort of physical mailing address. Um, you're required you need to have some place where a property management firm can get served. Um, late fees. In our lease, it's in bold. Um, the state lease is just a blank. This is just a right, this is just what we do. It's not unusual in leases to have a late fee after a certain time period. Remember that rents are due on the first, and then you have a time period to where, in which case, in our case, it's after the fifth, it will be late. Um, in North Carolina, your maximum late fee, by the way, is uh, $15, I think, or $25, or 3%. It's a ridiculously low number. In South Carolina, however, who decides if late fees are too much? Well, there's only one person that really decides if late fees are too much, and that's this guy. Um, judges or magistrates are the ones who decide if late fees are too much. I will say that um, the fee that we charge, uh, we charge a 10% fee. There are many different fees. There are tons of fees, whatever each business model charges, but we've never had a judge throw it out. <clears throat> Return checks. This was a debate for a long time under what can and cannot be charged return checks in the state of South Carolina. Uh, we had our lawyer uh, review it. It's not actually an easy thing to find, but uh, in our opinion, the maximum is, is $30. Make sure that you put in clear language in your lease what you charge for any penalties. Late rent, return checks. Is there a fee or an admin fee for processing a return check? If that's your business model, fine. Make sure it's in clear language, and in our case, we put it in bold, 
And if it's very important, we put it in bold, all caps. Occupants are very important. <clears throat> Just this morning at a property management meeting, I heard a case where the person who had rented the property, uh, her son moved in. He was not listed on the lease as an occupant. He moved into the property and quickly set up a meth lab. So it created an issue in that here you are, someone who's not legally an occupant of the lease, um, setting up a meth lab, you know, you creates issues. In South Carolina, joint responsibility is something that is not only important, but it's important for those of you that lease to more than one person at a time, especially if they don't have a legally binding agreement, which in say South Carolina would be a marriage. But if there are two people that are just roommates, it's important that you let them know that we are a joint responsible state. And what that means is you can't evict one and not the other. It's all for one, one for all. For us, we put it bold, all face caps um, to let people know who'd signed the lease, who's responsible. It's not just one or the other, even if they are, say, you know, especially for student rentals, which we do a lot of, you've got two students, they don't like each other, one stops paying the rent, maybe the other one is still paying the rent, you can't evict the bad apple, you have to evict both. If you're going after them, you want to clear up front, and this is why we have it in bold, all caps, is that, you know, I hate to go after the good apple for the bad apple, but that's just the way it is. You know, <clears throat> make sure it's clear up front and have a consistent written policy. You should be okay on this as long as the magistrate um, is a good magistrate. I will say that in 22 years, we did have a magistrate one time, um, for lack of a better term, bifurcate uh, some tenants. We had three tenants that we were evicting. They were damaging the property. They were um, three months behind on rent, we filed an ejectment. They had taken an extension cord from their unit to the unit down below them and tapped into their power onto their porch to generate power for their computers and their refrigerator, or kegerator, I should say. And one of the tenants we were evicting came in with an attorney, and the magistrate actually let that tenant off the lease. Now, that would be a great um, time for us to kind of go back and um, file an appeal, which case we probably would have won, but you know, you got to cut your losses sometimes. Appeals are, are very uh, expensive. But anyway, make sure it's in your lease. <clears throat> make sure your security deposits are very clear. Um, this one is ours. I'm not going to get too far into security deposits. And make sure that your trust account uh, information is in there. Um, a lot of property managers sometimes put the security deposits into interest-bearing accounts. There's very specific language that needs to be in there. This is the very specific language. I've had multiple lawyers. This is very similar to what you see in the state lease. Any questions about this at all? Essential service, this comes right out of uh, landlord-tenant law. It comes off the state lease. Um, if you have any questions about that, I'm not going to linger kind of on essential services. Um, spelling this out to tenants at the onset, in my years of experience, has been something that's very crucial. Um, understanding that some tenants, what they think is an essential service, and what is an essential service by law sometimes are two different things. I think most property managers get a lot of grief over not getting something, you know, the internet's down. Well, to students, that's an essential service. By law, that's not really an essential service. But getting it, you know, clearly drawn out in your lease is important. Inventory and appliances. Um, it's very important to put these things in here, especially in this day and age where um, washer and dryer may not be something that some landlords or owners will maintain. <clears throat> there are plenty of owners that have a washer and dryer as a matter of convenience, and if you want to use it, great. If it breaks down, however, um, we're not going to maintain it. 
but that needs to be spelled out in the lease. The state lease does not spell that out. Um, I think our recommendations as a state do, but in our lease it spells it out. If you see the second clause, um, you know, in the instance where a washer and dryer is not going to be maintained, we would check that box there. It's not going to be maintained. By the way, consistency, one way we have found to be very consistent with not only our policy but with our lease is our lease is done via video. We use a pre-recorded video and every tenant before they sign a lease watches the video. That way we know a few things. One, we know that the language that every tenant is getting is consistent. Two, we know that the property manager went over every single clause and we know that because it's a video. <clears throat> we actually have them sign something that says hey, I watched the leasing video and I had an opportunity to ask questions of the property manager who gave me the video. <clears throat> I don't say you have to do that, <clears throat> excuse me, but it's actually a, a great tool in a number of ways. It has tremendously increased our consistency because there's no way to be inconsistent. And two, um, you know, it, it lets the tenant really read through the entire lease bit by bit with someone who's explaining it in a video. I have found that the younger generation, not that I'm tremendously old, but the younger generation will sit and watch a video much more than they will listen to you talking to them. The other thing about it is, is if there ever is a lawsuit and a tenant goes, well, I didn't understand that part of the lease, <clears throat> which I have seen on many, many occasions. Magistrates, <clears throat> you know, if a tenant goes in there in front of a magistrate and goes, well, this is legal jargon. I don't understand it, and it wasn't explained to me that way. We go in there. We're going to go look. We have a video. The video is very clear. I could even show the magistrate the video where it's, it's clear and concise about every clause. We gave them an opportunity to ask questions about any specific clause. Um, so it's hard to lose a court case if a tenant goes in there and says, look, I didn't understand it. You had plenty of opportunity for that. <clears throat> Subleasing, I'll probably go through utilities, make sure that's clearly defined um, and who is, in, who is responsible for any and all utilities. If the landlord is responsible for some, make sure that's clear in there. Um, make sure that uh, you have a clause in your lease that says that utilities will be maintained during you know, the entirety of the lease. Um, that's important. You'll see these in some of these tenant responsibilities. This, um, and before I go on, any questions about that? Um, can we view a copy of the video for reference? Um, that's a great question. I can work on, if you email me, I can let you review our video. Um, our video is specific to our lease, but I'm happy to do that for you. <clears throat> these clauses, and these are my underlining on there. That's, they're not underlined in the lease. These are things that we have added in our lease some, but not all of these, made it into our recommendation um, for the state lease. Um, yes, one more question. Do you take down the serial number on the appliances for reference? Um, absolutely, if you can. Especially if they're new ones because you, you want to track the warranty information. So the answer is yes. <clears throat> Any other questions about that before I move on? All right, so I wanted to share these with you because you haven't seen them on the state lease yet, but these are things that I have seen over the years that have made our lives easier. Um, most of these have come out of issues that have come up. Um, and one is <clears throat> under tenant responsibilities. We make it clear what their responsibilities are. And we go over this bit by bit, you know, piece by piece, clause by clause in the video. And like under B, um, shall report any water leaks to landlord immediately. That's something that is, you may save you um, down the road. Tenants are not owners. Tenants sometimes see a leak and don't report it. Tenants also don't understand that if they report a leak quickly, the damage can be mitigated quickly. If they let the leak continue on, what may be an, a cheap quick fix can sometimes lead to 
thousands of dollars worth of repairs, sometimes leading to mold. We had an issue with a house um, years ago where we had a roof leak. The tenant should have noticed the roof leak. Okay, they didn't. You could argue that in court. But then they saw mold. Mold starts developing. If you have this in your lease, at least it puts the onus on the tenant, especially with leaks and mold. If you look under C, tenant shall report to landlord any malfunction, damage, electrical, plumbing, HVAC systems, and any occurrence known that reasonably should be known that may cause damage to the property. <clears throat> That's another clause that can help a property manager out in cases of damages. In other words, the onus is on the tenant. We explain to the tenant. It's just like it's your property. If you see something that's wrong, you need to let us know. Um, under Clause E, Routine Maintenance, tenants shall be responsible for and make at tenant's expense all routine maintenance but not limited to stop it if because of misuse of the work pipes, fixtures, due to negligent care, tenant shall replace any burnout like that. Little things like this can sometimes make a difference, especially when you're going maybe for your move out inspection and you're finding some issues. Um, in our lease, we found um, one of the biggest issues has been tenants not replacing the filters in HVACs. That is something that, you know, if you're an HVAC guy, you know that if they don't replace the filter, you know, it starts doing undue wear and tear damage on a, an HVAC compressor. So what we did is we had a clause where tenant is responsible, this is clause G, tenant is responsible for changing HVAC filters and responsible for HVAC servicing fee if any excessively dirty filter is found at any time. Tenants will also be held liable for damage to HVAC systems caused by dirty or missing filters and damages resulting from unreported problems. For us, that means that at any given point in time, if there's an inspection or in our instance when we have maintenance issues maybe for something else, our maintenance guys, and we have an in-house maintenance company, so they're trained for this, they go in and look for the HGH filter. If the filter is excessively dirty, we're going to get that serviced at the tenant expense. <clears throat> Without this clause, however, you probably wouldn't be able to, to go through with that. There's a question as a, how do you define what they're responsible for under routine maintenance? Well, if we have something that um, is routine maintenance, sometimes we'll post it on our website or like an instance of, say, the smoke detectors. Otherwise, they have a sheet, um, especially for properties that, you know, maybe have uh, um, different types of heating systems. Does that answer your question? And then most of the clauses, by the way, under routine maintenance are, are in these clauses themselves. It's got the HVAC. It's got the equipment under F. Um, and H deals with landscaping and maintenance. I deals with smoke detectors. <clears throat> we even have a clause for what happens when there is a storm coming and what, as a clause, you know, in the instance of ice coming up, you know, making sure they're, they're shutting the water off on the exterior hoses, spigots, things of that nature. Um, does that answer your question? I'm going to move on then. Um, here's our adverse weather. We added this in. Um, if the temperature outside falls below 32 degrees, the tenant is responsible for protecting the premises by taking steps to reduce the likelihood. Um, all right, I've got a question here on the routine maintenance again. Uh, my answer would be really that most of the routine maintenance is, is here in the clauses. Um, equipment and fixture routine maintenance is F. Really, the biggest things for us under routine maintenance is G, HVAC service systems. Um, routine maintenance for them is changing the filters. That's their routine maintenance. And that, that's done at, at their expense. Um, light bulbs are also in there. Smoke detectors are also in there. If you go to clause I, you know, tenants shall maintain batteries. That's the routine maintenance. Make sure that they change their batteries. Um, adverse weather does that answer it a little bit better, I hope. Um, okay, excellent. So adverse weather, we've included this, uh, especially in the upstate where you have that on a more regular basis. 
in the Charleston office, you know, we don't we don't have that, although we did have it twice in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've added a few clauses under rules and regulations. We've highlighted in bold um, under rules and regulations. And now rules and regulations can be city ordinances. They can be any um, covenants and restrictions for neighborhood associations. They could be if you've maybe you've got a condo you're renting for somebody and, and they have covenants and restrictions or rules associated with that um, regime. These are things that you need to add into your lease, this particular clause. And in ours, it's bold. Any such violation, and for us, a violation would be either the tenant, tenant's family member, guests, someone that's coming to stay on the property just for a few days, or for us, a guest would be somebody if you're throwing a party. If your guest at your party um, violated some sort of rule or did damage, um, any such violation constitutes a substantial violation of the lease and a material non-compliance with the lease and its grounds for termination of tenancy and eviction from the premises. We, we added this to a lease and did it in bold because when you go in front of a magistrate, if you had an issue, particularly if you have a tenant that maybe throws parties on a regular basis or violates the rules on a regular basis, but it's not really them, it's the, the guests of the party. I have seen it when they go in front of a magistrate and they go, well, it wasn't me, it was my guest. Now, some magistrates lean towards the landlord and go, well, you shouldn't throw these parties or you shouldn't have guests of that nature, and they allow the landlord to carry on with the ejectment. But some magistrates lean towards the tenant, and especially if the tenant says, yeah, that was a friend of mine and he went out of control and I'm not even friends with him anymore, he's never going to go. Judges don't like to put people on the street for the actions of others. In our lease, we put the verbiage constitutes a substantial violation of the lease and a material non-compliance. When judges see that, it gives us a little bit of a leg up from a legal jargon standpoint. Am I making clear on that? Any questions on that? That's pretty important. Um, alterations, it's clear in state leases, um, we made it, I think, all bold and caps, no repair costs shall be deducted from rent by tenant. That's really important. Um, that's a big issue. Um, tenants sometimes, if repairs don't get as quick as they'd like, or maybe it's something that an owner's not going to do, maybe it's not a, a, you know, something that's warranted, or, um, you know, maybe the molding's got a crack in it, or something minor of that issue, and they go, well, I don't want to get it fixed. As long as you have this language in there, they can't deduct it from the rent. And C, um, as to that, any fines, fees, or charges due to violations shall be paid by tenant. This is really important in homeowners associations, especially if they have fines. Um, a lot of them have them out there where you can't, you know, leave your garage door open or they'll issue a fine. Or you can't, you know, leave your, um, you know, car parked out or your boat maybe in the, in the front lawn or something of that nature. There are thousands of different rules out there and what I would suggest is you make sure you have that the violation gets passed through to the tenant because you have to remember that homeowners associations are not going to issue the fine to the tenant. They're going to issue it to the homeowner, to the homeowner you know, your boss essentially. So make sure that language is in there. Um, there's a question. Who wrote your lease? You're not an attorney. Must I get an attorney to write one like yours? Um, I would say I did not write my lease. Um, I got together with an attorney and we took bits and pieces of the state lease and other leases that I had seen. We took clauses we liked um, and we added a lot of verbiage to clauses. Um, as a matter of fact, I had two attorneys really review it. The question is, must I get an attorney to write one like yours? I would say no, I'm happy to send you mine. And my second thing would be the state lease when it gets approved and we're crossing our fingers that 2014 is the year it gets approved, um, really has a lot of these clauses in it. A lot of our clauses from our proprietary lease made its way into the state lease. If you want a copy of ours, I'm happy to share it with you. Uh, but no, don't write your own lease. Don't write your own clauses. Um, get an attorney. You cannot act as an attorney uh, in any way, shape, or form. 
Um, this is one I usually, when I'm in a crowd, I say it very delicately because um, it's not easy to say, but we have this issue crop up. Um, and item J, this did not make it in the state lease, by the way. In no instance shall feminine hygiene products or condoms be disposed of in toilets or drains. Um, some of you out there, I hope, are smiling or laughing. Um, it doesn't seem like it's something you would need in a lease. Um, but for those of you that rent to students, um, it's almost a requirement. Uh, I would say more than 50% of our plumbing issues and repairs that come out come about from that. Um, if we take that out of security deposit or if we evict them for uh, any issues and a, a magistrate sees that we've deducted for a, a plumbing repair and that's what caused the plumbing repair, <clears throat> believe it or not, there are judges who just think that's, that's normal wear and tear. Even if we bring in a plumber that says that's not normal wear and tear, that a, a toilet's not made for that. For us, we protect ourselves and our owner um, by having it, if you notice, it's in all caps and it's bold, you can't do it. Now if we have that issue in front of a magistrate, we, we show that, magistrate typically will go, okay, they violated it. Um, insurance is a big issue. Um, a lot of property managers these days uh, make tenants get um, renter's insurance. Um, not a bad idea. There are plenty of property managers that do that. But make sure that it's spelled out in your lease that the homeowner's insurance policy does not carry or is responsible for the tenant's personal property. Tenant gets broken into and their things are stolen, the homeowner's policy doesn't cover that. Any questions so far? Um, indemnification is very important. This is out of the state lease. I don't think this is any different than anything that most property managers um, have seen. I see I'm beginning to run out of time, so I might move a little bit quicker. Um, Megan's Law, that's in the state lease um, and is ours as well. Um, stipulation on no smoking. Yes, we have a stipulation on no smoking in our lease, um, at least on the inside. We also stipulate that without our permission, you can't use fireplaces. Um, there are times where if we have an owner that doesn't mind them using a the fireplace, if they're willing to take on the liability, you can add that, that you know, an addendum, the you know, tenant may use a fireplace. But as a general rule of thumb, no smoking in the premises, and that's in our lease. Uh, military clause is, is standard. I won't go over that unless somebody chimes in and says, I don't know what it is and I want to go over it. I can go back. Access is very important. I see this get hit a lot of times. Um, tenants complaining. I get this from property managers going, what can I do? Um, make access clearly defined. Um, hours of, of what they can, and when we can and cannot go, and why we can go. Um, under A, you know, an emergency, we can kind of go anytime. B, here are the timetables and see if we're showing it. Um, these are the timetables we can go. Um, I'm kind of moving quickly through some of these as a question. What are the legalities of telling tenant they cannot smoke within the unit? I've never heard of any law that prohibits um, uh, anything that, you know, that protects a tenant that says they absolutely or can smoke inside the unit. Um, unless somebody knows of one, I hadn't heard one. I haven't had any attorney tell me one, and we've gone over it many times with attorneys. So the legalities of telling tenants they cannot smoke within a unit, it's one of the rules. Um, this is probably, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, our things in our lease come specifically. This, by the way, section 2740-530 is straight from South Carolina Landlord and Tenant Act. Um, and under C, this section, that section is about access, um, give the tenant at least 24 hours notice of his intent to enter and may enter only at reasonable times. That's becoming a bigger issue because we now communicate with tenants differently, don't we? Um, 22 years ago, there was no such thing as email or text messages or anything of that nature. 22 years ago, if you wanted to let a tenant know, you had to call them and of course there's not really a good record of that, or you had to leave a note on their door. 
in this day and age, if you're using software, good software, our software records all of our telephone conversations. Um, so we, you know, we can't have a tendency to say you didn't let us know. The younger generation, and we email just to confirm that, and that saves our email, our software system. In this day and age, the younger generation, and write this down on a pad, in not too many years, email will be dead. None of our students email. They all text. If we email them, they say, oh, I didn't get it. I don't only take my email once every few weeks. So just notify, let, let them know how you're notifying them and be consistent on that. But that's what the law states. In our clause, you know, you have a move in and move out inspection. I, I hope you do. Um, lots of property managers do it differently. Some just sort of say, hey, here's a, a move in inspection form. We just fill it out. That's totally fine. Send it in. Uh, and then they review that when, they, when the tenant moves out. Our business model is a property manager, an inspector goes to the property. We meet a tenant at the property. We go through the inspection of the property, and they sign it. Um, that they agree with everything on there. When there's a move out, um, we also have them sign it. We added this clause um, under the move out inspection that tenant's failure to appear shall constitute the tenant's agreement to accept the landlord's report conclusive and final. Um, if you're not going to go to the move out inspection, Mr. or Ms. Tenant, um, then our lease stipulates that the way we find it in, in market is the you know, the final uh, inspection. You can't argue with us with that. I will say we have taken this to court only one time. We, we're not in court very often, which knock on wood is, is good. Um, but we have taken this to court and it was actually upheld. Um, who defines reasonable time? If someone works night, entering during the daylight time would be hard to schedule. The language um, is unreasonably withhold. Now, what we say, and we absolutely have tenants that work at night, if you look at the top clause, and this is from the South Carolina Tenant Act, um, under A, a tenant shall not unreasonably withhold consent. And what that means is if you have to do an inspection or you're, you're doing some maintenance to it or you just, you're showing the unit and they work at night, if they say, look, you can't come during that, I sleep. I work all night. I'm on a night shift. Um, don't show in the mornings. Then really, as a property manager, you have to work with them to some degree. Maybe set up a scheduling time. Well, what does work for you? And I'll start to schedule showings maybe for the afternoon. Um, if, for instance, you've got a tenant that wants to see a unit you're trying to lease, and the existing tenant um, will never allow you to show it in the morning, and the tenant that may be interested in it can only see it in the morning, maybe you have a little bit of an issue. I would say that you really kind of need to figure out maybe there's a day off, or something that is reasonable for both parties. Does that help answer your question? Same way with being ill, you know, if you've got a scheduled showing and someone's not feeling well, and they say, look, I don't want you to show the property because I'm not feeling well, that is very reasonable. And I think any magistrate would see that as reasonable. I've got company in town. You know, that is reasonable to some magistrates. It might not be reasonable to the person looking for the property, but you know, it, it's some gray areas, and in the South Carolina landlord tenant law, there's gray areas in that as well. So, um, can I skip over this? Um, uh, those are our inspections, condemnation, and foreclosure. Um, still to this point, um, to this day, until I think the law matures at the end of this year, but under foreclosure, the bank or maybe the servicing company for the FDIC cannot send a letter to the tenant saying we have foreclosed, move out. A lease is a lease. The only time that um, a tenant, a lease can be um, uh, eliminated essentially is if a person buys a property at foreclosure and they intend on using it as their primary residence. A lot of banks, especially national banks, and we work with a lot of banks and we work with several servicing companies across the country who we manage their properties they foreclosed on don't understand that in South Carolina, a lease is a lease. If you want the tenant out of the property, you have to wait for the lease to either the term ends or maybe you could offer them money to vacate the lease, but don't send a letter saying we foreclosed, move out. A lot of property managers do not know that and certainly tenants do not know that. Uh, so they think, oh, I got a letter from a bank saying I have to vacate. 
that's not the case. Um, abandonment, I'm, you know, I'm running out of time. So these are all of these are clauses. I think straight out of the state lease, we've kind of copied um, most of that information. Non-compliance of rental agreement, failure to pay rent. This is the you don't pay, you don't stay. Um, we clarify this really well, and that helps with magistrates. Um, I'll skip waiver. This is a real big issue for not only tenants but also property managers, and this is the clause that says, how long do I have to fix things? And under this clause, the basic rule of thumb is you have 14 days. Um, and sometimes, it, you know, if you read this, it's, you know, if you're breaching the rental agreement, will terminate upon a date not less than 14 days after receipt. This is the tenant remedies. So um, same thing with repairs, it's a 14-day process. Um, and most of this is geared for if you're not doing something such as clause two, um, if it's something that's affecting health and safety cannot be remedied, you know, there's not much you can do at that point. That's the law. <clears throat> Any questions so far? I see this more often than not. Most property managers do not understand this termination 30 days notice. 30 days notice does not mean the last 30 days. That's kind of what I want you to get out of this. Um, and for those property managers that manage property to students um, who are on a cycle of a you know, semester cycle, we lease most of our student rentals that are available in August. We lease them out in February and March. What that means is we would have to give 30 days notice well in advance. We give 30 days notice six months in advance on student houses. As a matter of fact, we give 30 days notice six months in advance on all of our rentals. Um, we like to find out early whether the tenant is staying. And if they're not staying, at least that gives us plenty of time to market the property. What that's done for us is our vacancy rate is less than 2%. And the, le the only reason why we have even that vacancy rate is we take on a lot of property. Um, we manage close to 1,000 units. And we take on new properties that are vacant. Otherwise, ones that we already have it almost never goes vacant. The reason for that, we give notice well in advance. Any questions about that? Still follows under the same guidelines of if you give notice on March 5th, the 30 days does not start until April 1st, would end on April 3rd. Any questions? And that's when when can be noticed. It can be given any time. Um, how can we get a copy of the form? I'm not sure what form you're looking for. If you clarify that, I will um, answer that. Um, and I'll get to that back to that in a second. Um, I should be near the end here, but our lease has move out guidelines. They are clearly defined. Our website has these move out guidelines. Before a tenant moves out, we send them an email, not once, not twice, but three times. It has the move out guidelines. Specifically, these are all the things you need to do to move out. Um, as a matter of fact, we're in the process of doing a move out guideline video that we will then send out. And in that video, we'll also stipulate, look, like most property managers, we want to give you 100% of your security deposit. It takes nothing to give out 100% of your security deposit. Manpower is just a few minutes. Dealing with cleaning and repairs, that's a massive manpower procedure. Um, so here's your move out guidelines. This is what you need to do. Follow all of these things. And assuming you have no balance due, you can get your security deposit back. Um, the rental agreement that I use, email me. I will send you our rental agreement. To answer, does that answer your question? So in our lease, we have these move-out guidelines. It's very clear. It's very concise. Um, on our website, it's in there. We email it. So there's no reason. You know, Things like this doesn't happen for us um, very often. Um, damage to premises, remedy after termination, kind of go through that. Um, uh, most of you are property managers, hopefully, and you know the process for that. We're near the end here, and what I want to say also to get this out is um, a lot of landlords do not understand some very simple things. Um, and one is security deposits. The common rule is the security deposits are due within 30 days of the termination of the end date of the lease. That's not exactly how the law reads. The law reads, and this is directly from the South Carolina Tenor Act, and it's 2741.410. 410. 
The law reads that any deduction from the security rental deposit must be itemized with the landlord and written a notice to the tenant together with the amount rental due, if any, within 30 days after termination of the tenancy and delivery of possession and demand by the tenant, whichever is later. Let me re re-say that. Delivery of possession and demand by the tenant, whichever is later. That means that if the tenant never demands, in theory, if the tenant doesn't demand the security deposit, in theory, you know, the way this is written, you're not required to give the security deposit back. Now, don't do business that way. I'm not advocating you to do business that way. I'm not suggesting you do business that way. And I will say that we always get security deposit back within 30 days unless there's an issue, in which case, if you're not getting back security deposit back within 30 days, you notify them. An example of that would be maybe there's some damage to the property and it's a, a window. They, they, they broke out a, a window and it's not a window you can go to Lowe's to. It's a window that has to be custom built and you can't get it within 30 days. In that instance, my recommendation would be something like this. Calculate what the window is going to be. Maybe you have an estimate. Get them a security deposit back that they are probably going to get back with a note that says, hey, there's an estimate in the window. As soon as that's in, we'll return whatever's left over if it covers. But the way the law is stated, it's whatever is later. Any questions about that? I rarely meet um, a property manager that really has read through this and really knows that. So it usually comes as a surprise to some property managers. Any questions about that? Well, um, that's all for me. If I have any other questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. Um, my email is john at rentcharleston.com. Um, I'm happy to send you any of this information. I am more than happy to share our proprietary lease. Um, I would say, you know, if you're going to take clauses out of it in your own lease, at that point, maybe consult an attorney. Um, you may get it kind of blacked out with our fees in there because, you know, fees are something that, you know, are, are business related and everybody has their own business model. Oh, good. Danny Ravenel, guys. <laughs> Great. Good to see you all. Anyone can email me questions later if you want to. You're more than welcome.